In this video, I'm going to show you guys how to build one of the best value 1440p gaming PCs that you can assemble right now. A build that offers up exceptional performance in both the latest AAA titles and easier to run esports games too. It's fairly easy to assemble and has good upgrade paths as well. I'll be guiding you through all the parts that make this build possible, some alternative choices you might want to consider, and of course looking at those all important performance figures a little bit later. Let's do this. The best place to start with any build is the CPU and GPU combo, as these are the two, well, they're the most important parts really in any system. And from these two components alone, you can accurately predict the kind of performance that is achievable. And in my mind, there's no better value for money combination in terms of cost per frame than this, the RX 7900 GRE and the Ryzen 5 7600. Now let's start with the GRE. The GRE is AMD's mid-tier GPU from the Radeon 7000 series lineup. You can find these free frequently for as low as $529, which is around $20 lower than the $549 MSRP. I'm going to look at detailed benchmarks later, but you can see how this thing lands in the likes of Apex Legends, Fortnite. It's a really, really solid card and beats out anything Nvidia have for the same price on a straight rasterization basis. Coupled up with AMD's sub $200 CPU, the Ryzen 5 7600, and this is an exceptional bet. This chip has 6 cores and 12 threads, and if I'm honest, is going to be more at home at 1440p, where the GPU is more likely to be the bottleneck, than 1080p. It still provides great performance at both resolutions though, and the GPU remains the most important part when you're trying to maximise as much frame rate as possible. Now, in terms of the other parts in the build, let's start with the motherboard. All the boxes for this build are orange, which wasn't um, planned, but I guess maybe we'll go for a black and orange theme today. This is the Gigabyte B650 Eagle AX. I do want to give massive props to Gigabyte, because both across their B650 lineups of the boards, but also some of their Intel and even their new X870 boards too, they're consistently some of the cheapest. If you look on Newegg, you filter out, you know, the features that you need, things like, for example, Wi-Fi, which we definitely want, Ethernet, they are just, well, the best value option for a lot of different builds, which is great to see. Now, of course, inside of this, I need a good RAM and SSD combo. This is our storage for the build. We've got 32 gigabytes of 6400 megahertz DDR5 from Team Group. This is their T-Force Delta, and we also have a Team Group SSD, the MP44 out. Not sponsored. One of the cheapest and best value drives, this and Crucial's P3 Plus, I'm a big fan of. And this RAM kit, often cheaper than Corsair's Vengeance, comes with a lifetime warranty and the speeds are good. You get it in black or white as well, which is great because you can colour match it to your build. Cooler, let's have a quick look at the cooler. This was sent over by ID Cooling, but I'm a big fan of ID Cooling's range. So I was quite excited to put this in the build. This is their FX360 Inf. You can see from the infinite mirror block. Now you might think, James, a 360 mil cooler is a little overkill for this build, and you'd be right. But at around $70 to $80, this thing is mega affordable. In fact, when you compare it to some slightly higher end air coolers with two fans or two towers, this is often price parity. And when you look at two 40 mil units from the likes again of Corsair or Cooler Master, this is pretty much the same cost and gives us three RGB fans and a bit more airflow. I've also got a couple of ID cooling fans in the case, should we need them? I'm not sure we will, but it's good to have the option nevertheless. Talking to case, let me guide you through what I've picked there as well, and we're going to need some room for this component. And it's another brand new part that I'm pretty excited about. And this is Montec's latest King 65. Now the King range, obviously with the King 95, was very, very popular. One of the best selling cases of the last year. We featured it on the channel. I'm personally a big fan. And this is basically, it's sort of, I guess, little brother. Now, as far as I'm aware, this uses the same tooling that the King 95 does, but without all of the more expensive panels, without the big RGB section at the front. And this only includes includes three ARGB fans as standard rather than the six that you get on the King 95. This just gives you one at the back and two at the side. These intake ones though are 140 and they're reverse blade so they look nice and pull in air as far as intake goes. Still get a lot of the nice quality of life features you got on the 95 like this removable radiator rail for easier AIO installation. The motherboard tray is still a standard ATX design. You've still got room for fans at the bottom. Montec are a slightly cheaper brand so there are some sacrifices that you'll make. Things like for example this 
corner. There's a little bit of sag there, but really not a great deal. And you can see, if you look close up here, where they've added a plastic extension piece where the original tooling for the King 95 was actually rounded. And that's the same at the bottom of the case as well. Do I mind it? No, but you can see how they've adapted this from the original design to the newer version. Again, like Gigabyte earlier, Montec, real king of the market right now as far as really great value parts goes. And the build quality is still on this really, really good, especially I think the pro version currently clocks in about 80 to $90, which is, well, frankly, extraordinary. Final component to discuss is the power supply. In this build, I've gone for Thermaltake's 750 watt smart BM3. More than enough power for our 7900 GRE. And it comes with a PCI Gen 5 power cable if you need one. We don't because the GRE uses standard six plus two pins, but it's nice to have that connector if you do change the graphics card out in a couple of years time. It is weird to think about upgrades to this system when we haven't even built it yet, but it's good to just have, especially when it's not gonna cost you any more money. First things first, I'm gonna install the CPU into the CPU socket. To do this, I'm just gonna push the arm down on the socket, lift the cover up and drop the chip into place, making sure to line up the golden triangle on the corner of the CPU with the top left-hand corner of the motherboard before returning the arm back into place. RAM or memory is next up. As I said earlier, this lovely 2 dim kit from Team Group. It's not too high profile, but if you are using an air cooler, you'll just want to check the height of the memory and make sure you're all good. Push the clips back on the second and fourth slot. That's if we're counting from the CPU outwards. Slide the memory into place, apply a bit of pressure with both of your thumbs and it will clip in with no problems. Once this is done, SSD is next up. Team Group's MP44L. These M.2 drives, super easy to install. I'm sure you guys have seen this a million and one times by now. Just need to go ahead and unscrew the top screw on the M.2 slot. Pull this out, slide the drive in and fasten it back down with a teeny tiny screwdriver. That's right, your full size screwdriver ain't gonna work. You need something a little smaller around about this size to get this into place. Nicely done, that's looking pretty good. There's only one more thing I am gonna do while the motherboard is out and that's take a quick glance at the CPU cooler. As often it's easier to install the mounting hardware on the motherboard now. I've got to say, I love this manual. This is amazing as far as actually being really easy to understand. You've got the big exploded diagram. So what you've got to do is take off the pre-installed AMD mounting hardware and then add on these four posts, these brackets, and then the cooler via these screws and these thumb screws is going to fasten on a little later. So for now, I'm going to make sure these are removed, install the posts, the top frame and the thumb screws, and then deal with the actual CPU water block a little bit later. Doing this now is going to make your life a lot, lot easier while everything is nice and easy to access. Amazing work, ID cooling that is absolutely fantastic documentation once the cooler prep is all good we should be okay for the motherboard all the standoffs are in an atx config by default meaning all that needs to happen is this just has to slide in get that rear io shield lined up couple of raised standoffs in this case so that's very useful thank you montec i appreciate it and then just nine screws talking of which they should be i was gonna say in the back of the case um let me um locate where they've run away to and then uh, i'll screw in the top three middle three and the bottom three to make sure that motherboard Board isn't going anywhere. With all that sorted, it's CPU cooler time. And I have to say, I'm quite impressed with this for $79 or so. Latest pricing and availability for everything mentioned today will be linked in the description down below. I'm going to install the radiator at the top of the chassis, a little something like this. That's going to provide a nice active exhaust airflow and keep the CPU cool, meaning all of my cables need to be on this far side of the radiator. These ID cooling fans very nicely click together like lots of CPU cooler fans nowadays. I mean, you can daisy chain one off the other and you haven't got to worry too much about cable management as it's one connector from one fan into the other. Once those are in, it's four screws for each fan. These can be included in the box for the CPU cooler. And then I just need to go ahead and line this up in the case. Now, yes, you could remove the radiator bracket and drop this in. I actually find things easy enough in situ as it's a little easier to monitor where all of the cables and wiring is actually going to end up. So all the screws through the top of this followed by a little bit of thermal paste on the CPU and the water block is going to screw in nice and easy. The final step really before popping the GPU in is to A, add some more fans. I'll do that shortly. But first, install the power supply. Now this is, as I mentioned earlier, a really nice ATX3 750 watt unit and it's going to be perfect for what we need in this system. It's affordable. It comes with all the modular cables you might need. The motherboard and the CPU power cables are pre-plugged in. That again just keeps the cost down, which we like. Now in terms of what power cables are needed, I'm going to add in a PCI, a six plus two pin dual harness. And I'm also gonna pop into place a SATA power connection. Now this is gonna be great for wiring up any RGB hubs, any fan controllers, anything like that. And that is pretty much all we need. With the case spun around to the rear, the power supply is then gonna slide into place without too many problems. The back of the case actually has this big swing open door. And you can see here that's secured
secured by a couple of screws, one at the top and then a further one down here towards the bottom. And you can see if you open that on up, that's going to make cable management a lot easier. Once the PSU is screwed in, I'm going to wire up the CPU to the top left, motherboard to the right hand side, and then do the front panel cables. So both the USB 3 Type A and USB 3 Type C, HD audio, which goes to the bottom left for the headphone and mic jack on the front panel, and the JFP1 block, which goes to the bottom right hand side for power, reset, and hard drive indicator LEDs. Talking to those fans I mentioned earlier, these are the ID cooling fans. These are the AS120-K, and they should just provide us with a nice bit of extra intake at the bottom of the case, just to provide slightly better airflow, both in terms of the upwards direction, then also through the chassis itself as well. So these three all gonna wire up to the bottom and just give us a bit more lighting and a bit more airflow within the system. And with all that said and done, it's GPU time. This is the Gigabyte model. I've said this in videos before, just go for whatever model makes sense. As Rock are normally pretty competitively priced, Gigabyte are the same. In this case, I'm gonna be installing it into the second and third slot. So you're gonna wanna remove the thumb screw just to make way in terms of the PCI lane. Do this for slots two and slots number three. Then once you've gone ahead and done this, you'll want to slide the GPU in to place. Ensure the uh, clip on the notch is pushed back. Pop the card in. Oh yes. Bit of pressure. And then I'm gonna use the same screws I actually unscrewed the PCI lanes with to secure the GPU back into place. So one screw just here and then the second just above. Now there is an argument to be had to using two totally separate GPU power cables and avoiding pigtails. That's where you've got two sets of cables on one. You may want to consider that. I've personally not had any problems with this thermal tape unit and I don't think it's necessarily that required, but it's definitely worth mentioning. Now I've just realized as I finish this build up, I have uh, put all those fans in the wrong way round. So give me a few minutes to um, flip them so they're in intake and not exhaust. And uh, I'll rejoin you after the montage to take a look at those all important performance figures. Not too bad. I have to say, I think Montec have done a really good job with this case. I like the King 95 and it's good to see a cheaper alternative. But how does the whole build perform? Well, let's have a look, shall we, and see what those benchmark numbers really look like. Now, starting off with Call of Duty's Black Ops 6, I've been playing loads of this at the moment. It's a game that does well on the 7900 GRE. And at 1440p, we're seeing over 125 frames per second on average. As you can see, the gameplay experience is really, really smooth. At 1440p, the game, I think, looks fantastic fantastic and gives you that nice balance between frame rate and higher visual fidelity. In Apex Legends, the frame rate went totally nuts. We're talking well over 200 frames per second with 283 FPS to be precise. Now, obviously this is a competitive shooter. So the extra FPS is really, really, really beneficial. The game looked fantastic again at 1440p and performed really well. AMD is a bit of a monster when it comes to frame rate in games like Apex Legends. Fortnite is next up and the frame rate was, wow, absolutely nuts. Slightly lower than what we saw in Apex, which is really unusual, especially considering we're playing at 1080p competitive settings. I think we're probably seeing here more of a CPU induced bottleneck. You can see CPU usage is about 70%. That is going to go higher and limit frame rate a little bit. But even still with everything tuned down to low, except the render distance, which was of course set to far, the frame rate was still solid, 282 FPS on average. Alan Wake 2 is next up at 1440p high settings. FSR was enabled and set to quality. But we haven't got any ray tracing or frame generation here to bear in mind. Here frame rate was good nearly 120 frames per second than average with 118 FPS throughout. Really good looking title, obviously more of a story game, so you're not kind of quite as bothered about those competitive frame rates, but still want a good gaming experience. Move through into Hogwarts Legacy, again testing here at 1440p high settings, and frame rates were again over the triple digit FPS mark, 110 FPS on average. There was only one game today where we didn't achieve that 100 FPS magical number. 100's the new, uh, the new 60 after all, right? Cyberpunk 2077 is next, and we did use a little bit of ray tracing. Now it's not as good on AMD cards visually as what you'll find on Nvidia, but here are the numbers. At 1440p high with FSR set to quality, AMD frame generation enabled and ray tracing turned on, we saw a frame rate of 113 frames per second. Now I wanna stress, visually it does not look as good. So comparing the apples to apples frame rates between this and an Nvidia based scenario just isn't fair, plainly. However, the game still looked absolutely playable and it's good to see AMD's ray tracing getting that bit better. Finally, the last game on the list is Black Myth Wukong. Before 
I share my final thoughts on this system. 1440p, very high with FSR set to the quality preset. And it didn't quite meet that 100 FPS mark, but at 97.6 frames per second, I think it got pretty close. I really like this build. I love the 7900 GRE. I think it's a great combo with the 7600. Yes, you're going to see a little bit more CPU bottlenecking than you would on a lot of other combos out there. However, it maximizes budget towards, well, the GPU, which is going to make the biggest impact on gaming performance. Really impressed as well with the CPU cooler. You can see temperatures here hovering around about the 47 degree mark on our 7600. But for the price, who wouldn't want a larger radiator that isn't going to cost them any more money? I'll link all the parts mentioned today in the description below. Thanks for watching. And as always, we'll see you in the next one.